A lot of the supporters, Steve, when they they hear the name Kenny Douglas, go, oh, you know that we didn't really get him as fans. I always say though it probably comes down to the fact that we lost Alan to the bad injury in the pre-season. John Doll Thomason came in, was asked to play in that position. You already mentioned Celez had to go out. It was, you know, it was probably accumulation of issues, and yet we still didn't do badly that that season. You know, we, we, we finished second in the league. You know, we got to win FA Cup final. So, what what was it? What was it that the players liked about Kenny? Okay. Sorry. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Kenny. Kenny was a very good coach. One two. Wait. Going off. That way. One two. One two. Yeah. The mics have gone off, mate. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Do you want to sort the sound out? Yeah. Do you want to sort the sound out? Yes, sir. We're on. We're sorted. Got him, mate. Don't worry. Right, go for it, mate. Um, he was a good coach. He was a, he was a good bloke, good coach. And he brought good coaches with him. He brought Alan Irvin with him. Um, who, as, as my career has gone on, I've spoke to a lot. He was an excellent coach. Um, but, you know, he did, he did have tough decisions to make. And... I think he made the right decision with Ginola, and um, people might disagree, but ultimately I do think David would have liked to have ended up where he ended up. Um, I think maybe the money he was getting offered for Les, um, he brought John Dal Thomason in pre-season, and I don't know if anybody went to any of the pre-season games. Um, we, played in, we played a tournament in Ireland, and, uh, and John Dal played number 10 off Shearer and off Les a couple of times and, and he was brilliant. He was really good in that role. And um, and I think that's why he brought him. And I don't think he brought him to be the striker. Uh, he's already got he got Les, Tino, Allen. So I think he brought John Dal as a young lad in to, to back up uh, to back up them. So made the decision to sell Les. Nobody could have foreseen pre season. Uh, it was Goodison, wasn't it? Allen ruptured his ankle ligaments out for a long, long time. I think Tino um, Tory stomach muscles shortly after. So we were ended up being with only John Dal. Now, first game of the season is key. I think he missed like I think he missed a one v one, it was a Cheffy Wednesday. Yeah. And I think you know how, how things could be different if he just slotted that confidence wise. But he was he was asked to play up front on his own and it just he just couldn't do it. He, he wasn't that wasn't his game. And I think when he left Newcastle he went on to AC Milan, didn't he? Yeah. And I think he was he was one of the Champions League League's top scorers next yeah. season. So he wasn't a bad player, but we just we were just unbelievably unlucky. And I think Kenny was unlucky. But um, got ourselves a second. Um, I think one of the, one of the best games you've talked about best games in your career. One of the best games I've ever played in um, performance wise. I think would be Arsenal one 0 at Highbury. I think Robbie Elliott scored. Um, I think it was me and Darren Peacock played against Burkamp and Wright, kept a clean sheet at Highbury, which was tough. Got to the Champions League. And then we had some fantastic nights after that. Played in the FA Cup final. But yeah, he was never he was never really I mean it's always gonna be tough to follow. I mean look look at Moyes following Ferguson. You know, nobody would say Moyes isn't a good manager, but it's very tough. And I think, you know, I think anybody following Kevin would have found it tough. I've had a lot of arguments, uh, especially with me, with my ex-father-in-law, my late father-in-law, who couldn't just couldn't say a good word about him, and I kept trying to explain my my point about it. But everybody, that's what football's about. It's opinions, isn't it? You know, everybody will have an opinion on every player, every manager, and nobody's right or wrong. And I'm just giving my opinion. And my opinion is, you know, I really enjoyed working under Kenny. Um, I can't. <laughs> that said, I can't. Um, I can't stick up for him for some of his signings later on the following season. Um, Barnes, Rush, not so much. Not so much Barnes and Rush because you know you knew what you were getting. But some of some of the lads that he brought in the foreign lads, um, I didn't quite get, um, and they didn't quite get. You know what we talked about earlier when Kevin brought lads in that got the city. You know there was no kind of there was no relationship with some of the lads that came in after that. Um, they didn't get the city. They weren't they weren't that type of people. But the time I spent. You know the time I spent with, with Kenny, the, the, the good times. You know I look fondly on, um, and I'd much rather him have stayed than the follow the fellow that followed him. Do you think? Do you think it was his? Do you, do you just think the fact that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't great in front of the camera, was he? He, he would an, he, he, you know, we'd answer a, a question 
with a question. He would, he would, you know, he played the media in his own particular way. I remember him doing an interview with me when he when he first came when I when I was doing the fans here, and he, he basically just said, "I'll not get a chance here." He says because the media have got it in for us, and he, he had that kind of attitude right from the start of walking into St James. Yeah, he was he was prickly, wasn't he? He was prickly. I, I get that. You know, I I, I saw that. Uh, it must have been a nightmare to interview to interview him at times. Ultimately, what he was doing, he was protecting us, and you know we respect him for doing that. But ultimately, he was he was putting himself at risk doing that because he wasn't winning many friends by doing that. That season, we, we had that run to Wembley. We've just been through one, which we'll we'll talk about in this half. But what what's it like as a player? A Newcastle United player going on a cup run. It was um, no, it was great. It was a really eventful cup run, if you remember. We had um, the, the the game against Stevenage was a bit of a circus, and um, and that was that, that was a big part of my career that, and a really defining moment. I mean, I I look back at my career. Of course, you can have regrets, and, and some of it you're proud of, and some of it you think I could have done more. But that was, and some of it you thought you were unlucky, but that, that day against Stevenage where we, we drew down there and then they came back to St James's. Now, I, I was in the England squad. I didn't get many England squads, but I was in the England squad that, that day and I was supposed to be going away with, with Batty, Rob Lee and Shearer that night to, to meet up with the England squad the Sunday at St James's. And I remember I tried, I tried to volley a ball across goal and I, I kicked the back of some of these studs and it was it was way before Beckham made metatarsal breaks. Uh, Fashionable, so I broke me met the tar. So I remember, I remember I was on the sideline. Derek Wright was looking at us. I had a little, a little hole in the top of my boot. Um, my World Cups. But I remember Derek saying that doesn't look good. And I said, well, fucking Derek, I've got to give it a bash because like I'm going away with England tonight. Harry Neville's already pulled out. Like I could get a cap here. And I remember stepping on the pitch. And um, as soon as I put my foot down, it just sort of crunched and blood started coming out of the little hole in the top. And that was it. I was done. So we got through and I went to the semis as a fan, it was brilliant. But we got through and I was, um, I played the, the game just before the final, I think we played Blackburn. And it was my first game back and I was okay, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't 100%. And I remember that, that terrible meeting that Kenny pulled us in before the game and, uh, at Wembley and just said, look, um, I don't think you're ready to start. And I was like, oh, Kenny, fuck, come on, I sort of gaffer. Come on, I said I'll get through. I'll get through on on adrenaline, um, and he said no. He said I'm gonna put I'm gonna put Pistoni in, and I was like fucking Pistoni. Like <laughs> anybody but him. I'd rather you put Terry Mack in. <laughs> anyway, didn't start. Um, didn't the game didn't go great. I came on for the last half hour, but it was it was gone by then. But that was uh, again. That was I look back at that and I think to start at Wembley would have been uh, playing an FA Cup final for Newcastle. You know, but always always gonna. You know, I'm going to hold that close, but to a start, it would have been amazing. Do the players feel the pressure? Does the squad feel the pressure? You know that, I mean, God, we're now another year without a trophy. Do you, do you feel that pressure, especially being a local lad? Do, 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 you know, as the, as the rounds go on, I know it's diff difficult for you because you were injured, but you did play in the final, so you, you, have that, you have that kind of feeling around you, the build-up of the week, the papers talking about it. Will this be the year? Will Bob Monker be able to re... You know <laughs> No, no, yeah. Not be the last person. I, I get that. Back. No, listen, pressure. Like the way I say it is, is, is if you're playing for a big club, um, you, you you've got to expect pressure. It's it's part of the job, and, and and you know you should be nervous for games. You should feel pressure. You should have butterflies in your belly. Otherwise, you're not in the right job. You know yeah. what I mean? So I always felt pressure. I always felt um, like there was pressure on us to win games, to win titles. To, you know, unfortunately, we never did. Unfortunately, we just failed again. But yeah, there should be pressure on you, and I think it's more it's more evident when you when you've been there a while, and it's certainly more evident when you grew up in the area, and you can't you can't get away from the fact, you know, because everybody, all your mates, everybody that you know, is is talking about it. Um, I think, as I said earlier, players are different now because they're kind of in cocoons, you know. They'll they'll come up, they'll they'll, they'll go in, they'll train, they'll go back to the house, they'll sit on the Xbox all night, they'll never go to a pub, they'll never go to a restaurant, they'll never go and integrate with, with people. So it's a bit different now. But back then, of course, yeah, it was massive pressure, but there'd have been something wrong if there wasn't, you know what I mean? It would have meant that you weren't you weren't looking to improve. 
I think a lot, a lot of things changed nowadays just because of you know mobile phone, social media. You said it before, you know, back in the day, you know, you were out on the quayside after a game. If you won, it was great. You'd be down to Uno's, get some food, and then you know, get into a few bars, and then end up in Julie's. You, if you did that now, you know, you'd be all over the newspapers the next day because somebody videoed it or photographed it. You know. I think a fair amount of our squad would have been delighted there was no mobile phones back then. By the way. I think uh, I think that little corner we used to hide in in Julie's if there was mobile phones back then. I don't I don't think any of us would have lasted very long marriage wise. But I think um, I think it is different now, and I, I, and I, I, you know I don't doubt it. But I just think they're different as well. I don't you know I don't think I don't think there's a drinking culture in football. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Like that was. The 90s and the 80s where I grew up and the 90s and the 80s where I was born in Wall's End and, and the, the way that everybody that I grew up with, my parents and my in-laws and my, my, my mates around me and then my dad's mates, you know, that is the culture we were brought up in. Not necessarily the case now, especially when you're looking at, I don't know, what, 80% of most squads, um, not from the area, I would say. So it, it is different. No, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying it was different. So Douglas goes... We get sexy football. <coughs> what, we just, what, what went we just. wrong? <laughs> um, I just, you know what, I think from minute one, I just think the way he worded everything when he came in, um, and he more or less alluded to it straight away, I want to bring this brand of football and I want to bring my brand of player. So that's basically saying, you know, I, I'm, I, if I could, I'd replace virtually everybody. Um, so I just got a call one night and I, I just wasn't even thinking about like, it never crossed my mind to, to, to leave. And um, I remember getting a call from the agent, uh, Paul Stratford, and he just said, um, we've had a, uh, Newcastle have had a, had a bid from, uh, and it was, it was Everton at the time, it wasn't, I went to Villa, but it was Everton at the time. Um, and I said, okay, I said, well, he don't usually, you know, he never phoned me before. And, I, and I'd had been bids for us before, but he never phoned us before. And he said, well, he says that the club have accepted it, the manager has accepted the bid. He says, do you want to talk to him? And I, I went in the next day, and this is, this is the part where I, I kind of really lost respect a bit, because as I'm, I haven't managed myself and haven't been in with, you know, Kevin and Kenny, um, I always just sort of meet you one-on-one -on -one and, 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 and chat about it. So I remember going into Rude's office and um, Steve Clark was with him and Chris McManamy was in there. and. He made them stay, so I was just sitting facing the three of them. I thought that didn't sit right anyway. But anyway, I just said, Look, I, I've got no intention of leaving. I'm disappointed you've accepted an offer, and I, I, I want to be part of the club going forward. I don't want to play for anybody else, basically. Um, and he just sort of said, Look, you're not the first I've had a bid for. You won't be the last to go through the door. I want to bring a different type of player in. Though. And by the time I left the office, I thought, You know what? I don't want to play for him. Uh, he doesn't want me to play for him, and I don't want to play for him. So I thought, as much as I don't want to go, I was probably a bit impetuous because could I have dug my heels in? Would I have still play it? I think I probably would, but I just I was so gutted about how that had went and how it came about. I just said, you know what, I've maybe got to go and end up going to Villa. And then straight, like literally within, I think three or four weeks, I think Bats Bats had left. Felt the same way. I played. I spoke to Philippe Albert shortly after. I think he went to Fulham. He said the same thing. I think Didi Haman left. Um, another, you know, another world class player. Um, not that I was, but you know. Uh, but and three or four or five left straight away, and that was just the way it happened. And I think if things had carried on much longer, I think certainly the Sunderland game at St James was in the rain, where he's left, um, where he's left Allen and Big Dunk on the bench. Um, I think that was almost him throwing a gauntlet down to probably the wrong bloke. Um, so obviously, I, I, honestly, I, I, Alan might tell you this himself. I think if, if things had gone on much longer, might, Alan might have had enough. But once you start taking Alan on in Newcastle, I think there's only going to be one winner, luckily, because you ended up with Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about Alan. I mean, you know. At the time, it was a record, you know, signing for Newcastle, fifteen million pound. Um, you know, what was what was he like as a as a person and, and a player to play alongside? Well, he's a fucking golf cheap guy, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just get that right. He's a cheater on the golf course. Um, no, listen, he was um, he was he was the best striker around. Which had seen what he'd done. He, he, I wouldn't say single handedly won the league for Blackburn, but he was just 
phenomenal, unstoppable really. And um, came came to us, and he was just he was different. Well, even though you know Les was as strong as Alan, um, Peter had a different skill set to Alan. Um, Coley was probably a little bit more of a sort of behind poacher, but Alan just had this ridiculous knack of scoring goals. And I know that sounds crazy, but you'd have a shooting session in, in training where you see you see players now trying to flick balls. He would just literally, he'd want to be the top goal scorer in anything he did. He'd, he'd take the goalkeeper's head off from two yards, his own keeper, Shea, Pav, to score in training. He just had this ridiculous like mentality, this ruthlessness that that is his personality really. And he was strong as an ox. You know as a right back or a left back or a centre half, you could hang a ball up or put it in an area and it would stick. And he didn't complicate the game. He'd, he'd, he'd take the ball in his chest, he'd thigh it down, he'd go wide, he'd get in the box. He'd come with his feet, he'd go wide, one touch, get in the box. He wouldn't try and do, yeah, probably because he couldn't, but he wouldn't try and do anything um, more complicated than that. And he was the best in the Premier League's history at doing that. So that, that's what that was amazing about. And he used to make fullbacks shit balls look good, which obviously I'm, I'm all for. <laughs> <laughs> Favourite memories for you as a player in Newcastle? Well, make me debut. Make me debut. Coming up through the ranks with a lot of good mates that I ended up playing as well. Um, that era with Kevin, um, just the whole the whole thing um, was just the best time you could have in football. The, the friends I met along the way. Games, um, you know, 5 0 against Man United. People keep reminding me about the four threes at Liverpool. Like we can't enjoy them, but I'm sure there were good games to watch for fucking somebody. Not, not I didn't ask, like, yeah. yeah. ask you about not it because the last time we did it, you um, just get. No, just no, I don't. Well, I don't. Everybody keeps saying them. how good were they? Well, fucking shit. You got <laughs> beat. Um, but Barca, the night of the night at Barca, the first one against Antwerp, the first time in Europe for me against Antwerp, five nil. Rob Lee, hat trick ahead of us. Um, me getting to, again. Me getting told from Kevin. I'd played, I'd played up front with Andy Cole for three games before. Scored a couple as well against Southampton. Kevin Saint was in Antwerp at the hotel about two hours before kickoff. I'm going to put you on the bench, and I was like, "Oh, Gaffer, why? Peter's fit." Ah, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Fuck it out. No arguments there. But um, but yeah, but the Barca game, you know, Mark, like Mark and Rivaldo um, at St James's, I like, just. Special nights, lots of them. Shit result, but going out to Wembley with a, with a, with a two and strip on, you know, just like loads of special times. Just missing missing that one one bit of silverware. I'd have took anything. Fucking charity shield was done. <laughs> Scoring at Anfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was my best goal like of my career. I've scored I've scored quite a few com considering I'm a defender, but um, that stands out. Um, scored a scored a hat trick for Everton against uh, Leeds in the Premier League, but that one stands out. Yeah, that one stands out, especially when you marry a, a Scouser. All was good. All was good to hand out. <laughs> Fast forward to your playing career coming to an end. You, you know, you take your coaching badges, and, and you, you've gone into management, haven't you? I mean, not everybody can do it. Um, you start you started off at, at the lower league, and you still maybe got ambitions to to get involved. Uh, you know, it, 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 the club again at some point. But what, what's it been like going from being a player to being a manager? Um, I found, like, I found people say to me, like, because you've, you've spent your whole career in the Premier League, have you found it hard coaching um, non-league? And to be honest, not really, because because of the way I am as a person, the way I've been brought up, like, I can, you know, I can handle, I can handle any standard as long as I get players that want to want to improve. You know, players that haven't haven't got chips on the shoulder. So that, that, that tends to happen on the you tend to get a good bunch of lads and then you try and make them better. Um, would I like to manage higher? Of course, but I'm realistic as well. You know, I, I know that I've never I never reached those heights and I had a good, I had a, I had a chat with Hopi about it, you know, Craig Hope, uh, about it and um, about you know Frank Lampard just, just walking into a um, championship job and Gerard walking into the Rangers job. And I get that, you know, they they are world class um, high profile players and I get that I was never going to be able to do that so my mind, mind was look if, I, if I'm going to make it there I'm going to have to do it the hard way so took the job at um, 
Macclesfield when I came out of uh, when I sort of reassessed what I was doing. Went to Macclesfield, won the National League with Macclesfield with John. Went to Gateshead, loved coming back up here. Done relatively well at Gateshead. Went to York, done well with York to a, to a point. But ultimately, um, had to you know had, had to come out of it, take a little step back, and then eventually I went to the. Um, I've went away. I wanted to go originally. I, I applied for the under twenty one job at the academy. Moved back to the northeast, um, and I'm currently coaching at the academy now. Is it what I want to do? I don't want to be coaching at the age group I'm coaching at. I'd love to be coaching at the highest level at the academy, but that's something I'm going to try and get to. Is that a process that you know you can see happening moving forward? I mean, it's 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 early days in the takeover, isn't it? And I think we were discussing before we came on. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. There's so much neglect happened at the club over the last 14 years that these new owners, yeah, they're going to get things right, but it, it's going to take time. The club's got um, the club's got a load of catching up to do, and it's not it's not their fault. You know what I mean? It, it, there's a lot happened over the last 15 years that has been neglected that you can't just change like that. I've got no doubt that the people in charge now and the people that are trying to trying to change it, want to change it, you know what I mean? But just can't, I was speaking before there, it can't happen overnight, you know, you can't you can't change an academy um, and you can't just get players ready to go into the first team overnight. It's a process of three, four, five years. Only really the first team you can change players like that because you bring players in that are first team players, but when you're talking about going through the academy, um, it is a process. It's everything, you know, it's, it's, it's the way that things happen behind the scenes at the club. You you you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's it's the way that staff are treated. It's it's everything. Uh, every everything everything needs to catch up to, to what had happened. But it doesn't happen overnight. It's going to be a process. The main thing is we're going in the right direction where you know where everybody sees, which is first team level. And, and despite you know despite the setback at the weekend, we are we are going in the right direction. Is it is it important for the club to maybe in the future link up with some of the you know the academies and and, and the clubs the boys clubs around the northeast Wales End, Red Youth, two of the most famous clubs on both sides of the town who've you know brought a lot of great professionals through the game and you know in times gone by is it important that they link up with them and maybe with you know the non-league teams you manage the Gateshead you know would it be good to have some of these youngsters that come in rather than going to say Hearts going to you know, going to Gateshead and trying to help the local team. I think so, but you know what that it boils a lot of that boils down to what the players and the parents and the agents want to do. So, for instance, I think it's a really like if if a player's on the fringes of Newcastle's and the twenty ones and then go out and get games in the National League, I think that's vital. I think I've seen loads of players that have done that and have, have, have improved because of it. But sometimes you'll get a parent or you'll get an, an agent say, well. They're at Newcastle United, no way they're going to the National League. They need to go to the Championship. But the reality is, they'll go to the Championship or League One and not play. So I don't I don't I don't see the value in it. But that that is that is more than that's more the, the agent, the parent and the player wanting to do it as much as you know, Mike Williamson's an ex Newcastle player, he's got a good relationship with the club. Um that would be a great you know, be a great uh, they they're shorter players. They're struggling this season. They they'd probably love Two or three Newcastle players, but the players have to see the value, and the, and the agents have to see the value, and the club, in fairness, has to see the value and send them there. And, that, and that's, I think, that's what Shola does at the moment. Shola's deciding where to put players. Now, I, I'm all for players going out and going into League One if they can play, but I think, it's, I think it's totally pointless exercise sending them out to somewhere and not play. How good a job has Eddie Howe done uh, for Newcastle United since he arrived? Well. You can't argue with the job Eddie Howe's done. I mean, you can argue with you can argue with bits and bobs of it, and, you, and obviously people will. And I've heard I've heard some outrageous comments after the weekend. You know what I mean? I really have. But ultimately, you just have to remember how far we've came in this space of time. If we'd have started the season badly or slowly, and we'd crept our way to where we are now, we'd all be buzzing. But that's just the nature of the game. We've been starved of success for so long that. We've we've got a taste of it, and it, now all of a sudden, some t some something feels like we're going that way. Well, really, we're miles ahead of where we should be. Um, we haven't spent a great deal. If you look at Man U at the weekend, fact is they, they are miles ahead as a squad. The miles ahead as a squad, and, and and that's just fact. And 
could we have played better? Could we have created more? Yeah, we should have and could have. But ultimately, you bring in Jaden Sancho and what, an 80 million pound player or half an hour ago, no disrespect, we're bringing <coughs> Jacob Murphy, Murphy on. So that's, and that's no disrespect, that is just where we are. So I don't think, I don't think we're miles, you know, I think we're going in the right direction. I think we're probably ahead of where we all agreed we would be, or where we thought we would be this early. But we've been there, we've been higher up. And it's hard, it's hard not to think about that. It's hard not to think about Champions League. It's hard not to think when we've been in the top three, four for so long. But we're still all right. And I think we'll, I think we'll keep improving. Yeah, yeah me, me too. I, I mean, this is an important, you know, second half of the season now. Uh, you know, should Eddie Howe look at this as maybe a chance to look at some of these players that, you know, haven't been able to get in the team because the team has done so consistently well? Should he... He's going to have to look at Gordon. He's going to have to look at Isaac. He's is he going to have to look at Elliot Anderson? You know, it, it, it's pointless giving him ten minutes here, ten minutes there. If you're not going to look at the kid and see what he can do, you're not going to know. I think Gordon's going to be a really good player. Yeah. I think Gordon's going to be a, a, a really good player. It's such a pity that we, you know he wasn't he wasn't able to make a difference at Wembley or even be eligible. Um, I think he's a great signing. Um, I've spoke well, obviously I've got a great relationship with Everton. Um, speak to a lot of them, and he's. Um, He's, he's top draw. I think you're right with Elliot. I think it's a really tough one because Eddie seems to um, always want Elliot around the squad, but Elliot never seems to sort of play a 21s game. So, you know, Elliot hasn't had a lot of football. He's, he's in sort of, he's in that little no man's land. And I think you're right. I think coming at the end of the season, um, you'll probably want to have a look at him in games and obviously Gordon will go into game. I think, I think Eddie will have made his mind up about a lot of people. I think you'll know. I think you'll know what he needs to do in the summer. But obviously, he can't do anything about it now. But I think I, I think he'll have made his mind up already about a lot. But you're right. I'd love to see. You know, I'd love to see exactly what Gordon's got with half a dozen games, and I'd love to see Elliot be given a few games. Okay, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you guys. So if you've got any questions, stick your hand up, and we'll uh, get through as many as we can. Are you putting it? Mrs. Watson. <laughs> yes. Well, you were going to know what happened in Julie. <laughs> yeah. Being totally unbiased, she rock in. She rock in. She Yeah. Because I think um, I think he's a better goal scorer. I think he's a better goal scorer. I don't think he's. A, if you talk about all round player. Um, Alan couldn't, Alan couldn't drop into a number 10 and spin and clear those passes or he wouldn't even try to. But as an out-and-out out, an out out goal scorer, tell you what, fucking love to see him together. More than any other two, I would think. And he, by the way, Alan has got an unbelievable respect for Harry Kane as well. And I think he knows that it's coming. It's coming <laughs> yes, man. Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't playing. In I that, think it's brought down to Shea given not being there. Yeah, <laughs> we had we had Pavel and Shaka didn't win that season that we didn't win the league. You're shaking your head. It's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> Shea wasn't there that season. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Yes, mate. Most underrated player that you. Yeah, just say that's the second time I've made that mistake. It's okay, you're forgiven. <laughs> you're, you're shaking, you're You're forgiven. <laughs> it's, a vote, it's a vote of approval for the beer they're selling you. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not an expert in, in human, uh, human body or language, but I'm getting the feeling you're not a big fan of shares, is that right? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's opinions, isn't it? It's opinions. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I don't know if he's. I don't know if he's underrated because I think people respect him. But who doesn't get a mention? I mentioned him before. Who doesn't get a mention a lot is Bats. Yeah. Is Bats for me in in that era? Um, bearing in mind, I used to go. Bez used to go. Philip used to probably go. Rob Lee, the NC. Bats used to just hold everything together and he was a much better player than I ever give him credit for. He was one of them players, you know, before you sign somebody, you kind of got your mind made up about somebody. 
And I was thinking this fella's just a like a crab, like side to side, puts a tackle in, makes a foul, but much better player than I ever give him credit for. Great player. Did he used to turn up with a carrier bag when he's booting? Well, he did. He just, just as I say, he just like he wasn't a, like he wasn't a stereotypical footballer. He just used to rock up, um, boots in hand, Asics tracksuit on, train away like, like a just, Sunday player. Yeah, he was. I he was. Apart from having a fag like at, at half time, and, and that was, he was kind of a Sunday player mentality. Yeah. Okay. Did you have your hand up? Yes, sir. Yeah, like, um, you touched on the throwing before. When you obviously do a lot of field at Mars End, it's itself. But what was going through your head when you did it? Afterwards, it was fucking idiot. Like, <laughs> I've done, um, done it loads of times. After doing it down there, and like, obviously falling foul a few times, you know, on sand. And I did it a few times. It used to be Benwell back there in the training ground. Um, and once I got, once I got the knack of it, like, it used to fly. But you needed a good run up to do it. So I used to do it all the time for the juniors. And like, Steve Howie used to come up from the back, like, late. And I used to ping it beyond the far post, and then I used to miss, and then we used to fucking start again. But um, I did it at Ayrson Park once, and I don't know why I did it, because there's only about this this much room to do it in. And I just thought, I've got to do it, like, because I was 17 or 16, I thought it was great. And I looked, I looked back, and it was just fucking like, well, divvy. But I'd done a normal throw in straight afterwards, and I threw it, like, twice as far. So it was just a bit of a thing, but Aussie... Aussie pull a stop to that, like, put a fucking total stop to that. Did it pre-season in Sweden once. He'd never seen it before. And there was a running track around the pitch, and I, and I, and I did it, and it went miles, and he fucking got in at half time, and he went, uh, Steve, he says, uh, what the fucking hell was that? And I said, oh, that's my throwing Aussie. And he went, never do that again. And I went, fair enough. <laughs> and that was it. I only did it again once, and that was in Peter's testimonial against Celtic. Yeah, fantastic. Yes, mate. Steve, I'll just ask your thoughts about VAR and how it can be improved. <laughs> um, it can fuck off for me. Like. <laughs> no, nah, listen, I, I, I just, I, I, I just don't. I think clear and obvious is the only way it can be for you know, like elbows, toes, fucking earrings, like it's, it's, it's shadows, and it's yeah, and it's taking too long. It's yeah. taking too long. I think if they're gonna have to use it, it's just got to be clear and obvious. Otherwise, you have to let the ref get on with it. Like you have to, you have to just let the ref get on. With it. You know what it is ultimately to me? It's five or six people every game with a job, like yeah. giving somebody a job. Like it's a complete waste of time. Some of it. So no, for me, honestly, for me, and I, I'm not, I'm not. Listen, I'm in the academy now where everything's done on a computer and everything's got to be, um, everything's got to be done right, and I get that. But for me. I'd be quite happy just to go with a ref and two linesmen, oh. and he makes a mistake, and yeah. you know, and, and it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Yes. What did it feel like to put a tune top on for the first time to walk up St James's and just the feeling of? Ah, what did it feel like to wear a Newcastle shirt for the first time and go out at St James's Park? I no, it's um, it's it's hard to explain it. it, it you know you. Especially when it happened so young, I was, uh, as I say, I'd done my exams in, I think I'd done my exams in July, and I made my debut in December, in November, and um, it was just, the first, the first season for me was just a blur, it was just total adrenaline, and I was, for me it was like, I was still playing with my mates, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any nerves, uh, there was no pressure put on us for, by Jim Smith or anything, um, all my family, my dad and everybody at the game, it was just, it was surreal, you know, my dad, my dad went back after the first game in tears. You know, I've never seen my dad's, dad's brought him in the, in the shipyards. I've never seen, I've never seen him, uh, never seen a tear anywhere near the block. And then he, he, all of a sudden... I was uh, one of them that was there when, when he first started. Like, it was... I'll tell you what though, the second, the second season was, and I told you about Steve Black and that. That's when I found it hard, when I had a season and then another good season. And then the third season, the, 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 the pressure, the expectation, hard. Hard for us, like, I just turned 18 then, um, and it took us, it took us, I say, a year and a, and a really good, come back a really good coach to come back. Aye. So it's not easy for young kids, like. Yeah. Okay, next question. Yes, mate. Who was your boyhood hero? Boyhood hero. Um, Chris Waddle was probably my boyhood hero. My, 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 my Newcastle boyhood hero was probably Chris Waddle. 
Um, my hero as a player, who I used to love when I was growing up, was Glenn Hoddle. I used to love watching Glenn Hoddle play. But um, coming out of me football now as players, you look back and you think, who's um, who's left the who's left the most on you? Who, who, who do you look back on and think is the best player over a, over your whole career? Um, Peter Bierzi, without doubt. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, mate. Without bias, if there's any favourite, what would you say to Newcastle all-time 11? All-time 11? In your lifetime. In your, in your lifetime. Ha! Right, should we leave the keeper? <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave the keeper, right? We'll go... I'm guessing said. From what I've seen, trip here. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> trip here right back. Um, Beardsley, go what? Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan Woodgate, uh, um, Philippe Albert Botman, uh, probably Albert for me. Um, Bez, right. you, who, would, who would you be charging Bez with? In your lifetime. Left back. You was pretty decent. You asking me, though, aren't you? <laughs> I'd have Batty, honestly, I'd have Batty, I'd have, um, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that, I could tell you 11, I wouldn't, I'd have Des Hamilton next to Batty. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you'd have Genoa, wouldn't you? You'd have to have Genoa, you'd have, um, you'd have Rob Lee, you'd have Beardsley. Could you fit Gaza in somewhere? Yeah. So only one left, Big Al. Big Al. <laughs> given. Moving on. <laughs> that's, a, that's a given. No, you know what? I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say only. Only keeper. Only keeper that was better than him in my opinion was Mike Cooper. Mike Cooper. Couldn't even. Couldn't even keep people out of the pub. See how they are. Was at the red line in Chester Street last time I seen him. <laughs> Okay, uh, well I guess, I guess that leads to a question I can ask you, and it's one we've asked everybody down here. Um, uh, you know, w is there anybody from the entertainers team um, who would get into the current team? But I, I, I guess all of them. I mean, listening to your 11 there, is, is, is it, it would be easier to say, is there anybody from this current team who could get into the entertainers I think, team? To be fair, I think, you talk, if you talk about people I've played with, I think the goalkeeper is exceptional, Pope. Yeah. I really do, I think he's, I think he's exceptional. I think he'd... Um, He'd get in there. He'd get in. Trippier. And Trippier would get in as well. Bruno would. Well, you talk about. You're probably talking about positionally. Um, Bruno or Batty. Yeah. Okay. You talk about Bruno or Batty. So I don't think there's much in it. I think Bruno can do more than Batty is in. His all-round game. Yeah. But I just saw the team we had. What we asked Batty to do was perfect. Mm -hmm. um, for then and then, in all honesty, beyond that, I am obviously biased. Beyond that, if you're talking about Maxi, um, Callum, Miggy, uh, Joe's, the turnaround for that man's fantastic. I do love him. I do love the guy. Um, Longy, I think he's, he's improved massively as well. But I would say that the sort of the front five end be hard to hard to replace. Sort of Genola, Shira, Rob Lee, Biedzi. Yeah. Um Impossible. Anybody else got a question? Okay, toughest opponent. Um, physically toughest. I remember on my second, third game, sorry, I went down to Notts Forest and played, and it was called. It was one of the variations. I think it was called Zenith Data Systems. Cool. And I was seventeen. No, I was still sixteen, and he was at the height of his uh, lunacy, and it was Stuart Pearce. And I remember, I remember playing playing at Forest. He came out and. Trent and started shouting psycho, 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 and he was just standing in front of him going like that. And I remember looking up from my warm up thing and fucking hell. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? But in fairness, he was hard, hard as nails, but fair. Wasn't dirty. It wasn't like the Wimbledon team where they'd be just out of order. Like he would he would tackle hard, but he was he was fair. But the one that caused us most problems, um, regularly, pretty much regularly, uh, Thierry Henry. Thierry Henry was the hardest opponent I've played against. I, I, bear in mind, playing on the left, Giggs, McManaman was excellent, really, really good. 
um, obviously through the middle, Zidane, Burkham, um, Kylian Zidane for Newcastle in the pre-season friendly, he was ridiculous. But the one that causes most hassle, like more than once, twice, pretty much every time, um, Thierry Henry. Steve, sorry, what do you mean by hassle? Just wouldn't just wouldn't stop running down my side. That's what I mean. Like <laughs> your centre forward go down the other side every now and again. <laughs> No, I tell you what, I played against him. I tell you when I knew he was going to be unbelievable. I played against him. Remember when we played Monaco in the UEFA Cup, and um, it, that was back in the day where, as a right back, you could use your arm. You know what I mean? And he was young. He was young at the time. So every time he kept trying to turn us, I could block him, and he wouldn't get a foul for it. And he must have sussed the fact that every time he was trying to turn us, I was stopping him. So ball went back to the um, ball went back to the left back. I've went to block him. He's just ran off the pitch, like Bale did. Ran off the pitch onto the running track, back on, 10 yards ahead of us. And I just thought, this is like fucking Olympic sprint I'm playing against this Yeah, but also with a good touch and a decent finisher. So he was um, he, he was brilliant. He was he was really elegant, brilliant, but a nice fella as well. Not one of these dickheads like you think are aloof and they won't talk to you. Like, he was good crack. Best manager you played for? Kevin Keegan. Um, Kevin Keegan, but the best coach I played for, David Moyes. David Moyes is an excellent coach, really good tactically, um, attention to detail, made a massive difference at Everton. Got a, got a pretty average Everton team um, into the Champions League my last season, and it, no real superstars, no nobody that you'd say. Um, we probably get into a lot of the top teams, 11s really, but just got us all working hard and, and disciplined in shape. Uh, David Moyes, excellent coach. Steve, sorry, why, why do you think you lost the boot room at Man Newman? I just think he came into a club that had won everything with senior players, and I think he tried, and he'll admit this himself, um, I think he came in and tried to change too much, right. um, whereas it didn't, it probably needed tinkering with. But I think he's a control freak, and it was his second job. And I speak to, you know, Rene Moulinstein that used to be at Man U, he was Fergie's number two, I speak to him quite a lot, and he, and Moyes, when he came into Man U, he sort of, he almost like completely been the staff. he took all his own staff. Yeah, and, and, and you know, if you've won the league, and you've won the league yeah. half a dozen times, yeah. you'd like to think that they've got a bit of value. I think he, he probably, but he probably admits that himself now. You know, I think that's that's a learning curve. And, but me, he paid the price for it, didn't he? He got, he got, he got, he got sacked for it, and he got, and he got put, you know, got abused for it. So, but I think he admits that, but, um, I think that's I think that's what he did wrong. I think he just came in and he started. You know, have you seen the Cluffy movie um, yeah, 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 yeah. where he's gone into Leeds after they've won yeah, yeah, the title yeah, and he's yeah, yeah. said, "How your medals in yeah, the bin?" Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it's far off that. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> biggest regret in, in your career, Steve? Um, not uh, not waiting it out when Rude was there. Uh, I'd love to have worked under the, under the next manager. Um, shouldn't have left. I didn't really. I didn't. I wouldn't say I didn't enjoy my time at Villa, but I just wasn't, I almost like I hadn't come to terms with leaving, because I'd never really thought about it. I had a really good five years at Everton, but biggest regret was probably um, probably handling that differently. But I was, like, I was emotional, I was still pretty young. Back then you didn't have a lot of great advice. Um, so yeah, I regret leaving, to be honest with you, because I'd love to work in the Bobby, but um, you know, you, as I say, that, that's decisions you make at the time. You can't do anything about it. Where do you see Newcastle finishing this season? Well, I think they'll find, I think they'll find it hard on Saturday because I think, A, um, they'll be low. They'll be really low and it's, it's tough to bounce back. Good thing is, I think you've got a couple of fresh players to come back in. Um, but get Saturday out of the way. I know Eddie's, Eddie's done amazingly well and I know, like, the work that they put in defensively. I just think we have to, and it's hard because you can't bring anybody in, but you can't rely on clean sheets all season in the Premier League. You know, you can't rely on the defence. The defence have been the stars of the season, really, haven't they? Yeah. You know, you look at Pope, you look at Trippier, you look at Shaw. Shaw was the one at the start of the season when I thought Target was going to start all the, the games at left back, so I really like him. He's done nothing wrong, by the way. Um, Burn and Botman and I thought Shaw would be the one to struggle but he's been outstanding he's been absolutely outstanding Botman's been incredible Burn you can't not play him um, albeit there is times where you can tell he's not a left back
but you can't not play Dan. Uh, and I just think the five of them, along with Bruno, um, have been the stars of the season. But you know that, that, that tells you how hard it's going to be if they're the, if they're the ones you're relying on week in week out against top quality teams. It's going to be tough. We just we need we need to uh, we need to do more up top. We certainly do. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a fantastic night. That's the end of the show. Put your hands together for Steve Watson. Okay, if anybody wants to get anything uh, signed or get some photographs, feel free to come up. Steve will just 